Hey, thanks very much, Karen. And uh, I want to also give special thanks to Barbara Sedina, a good DC friend of mine who put me in touch with Karen. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight for the Harvard Club. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had lunch today with my old friend, Mark Woodbridge, who is descended from the first Harvard graduate, Benjamin Woodbridge. And I should also note that it was a Harvard course in archaeology that began my career as an archaeology writer, because that's what I do for a living. All right, so let's talk about Jerusalem. Uh, I'm often asked how I ended up writing about this very strange and controversial place. And the truth is, I was brought kicking and screaming uh, to this subject. His books too. <laughs> Having spent uh, a couple of decades covering archaeological digs across the Middle East, I really tried to keep my distance from this place. There seemed to be too much politics, too much religion, and everything mixing with what I imagine was too little science. Uh, but then a few years ago, I spent an afternoon with a well-known Israeli archaeologist who gave me a tour of the city's underground excavations. And not only was I blown away by the extent of the digs going on underground, but uh, I also was curious about the tunnels and trenches that they mentioned that were dug by previous generations. And so I myself began to kind of dig into that history, as it were, and I realized that there's a, a, an intriguing and important story that has not really been told. And I also came to the conclusion that the volatile mix of politics and science and religion is exactly what makes Jerusalem not just controversial, but interesting. So I, I want to give thanks to National Geographic. Uh, I was able to spend about three years shuttling back and forth uh, to the city, uh, gradually peeling back its many layers. And I was fortunate enough to be joined by National Geographic photographer Simon Norfolk, who has shared some of his unpublished photos that I'll be using tonight, uh, many more of which uh, do appear in the book Under Jerusalem, uh, which, as Karen mentioned, was just published. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and give you a little PowerPoint. And there we go. I'm hoping everybody can see clearly. Uh, this is one of the images that Simon Nolfa took while we were uh, in Jerusalem uh, probing all of its underground spaces. <clears throat> now, first of all, many of you, if, if we were in a live audience, I would say how many of you have been to Jerusalem? And I'm sure a good number of you would raise your hands. But it, for those of you who have not, I think it's useful just to get a sense of geography if you're geographically challenged like I can be. So if you look at the screen, you'll see us moving in to uh, the site of Jerusalem, moving in to the Levant. You see Egypt on the left. You see Mesopotamia or Iraq on the right. There's the Dead Sea. And we're coming down on these rugged Judean highlands. Boom, right on top of the old city of Jerusalem. And what you're looking at there, that rectangle uh, in the picture, is the city's ancient Acropolis, known to Jews as uh, as the Temple Mount and to Muslims as uh, the Noble Sanctuary. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that very important place. And hold on, I'm just, there we go. Uh, so the obvious question is why is Jerusalem so famous? Of course, there are three faiths there that consider it uh, holy and there are countless shrines but it's a place with no port, no river, no major crossroads. It's very odd that this city has become so famous uh, and so controversial and fought over. Of course, the, the three major shrines you're all probably familiar with. There's the Western Wall, uh, the bottom left, which uh, is sacred to Jews. You have the Dome of the Rock, which sits on top of that Acropolis, uh, which is the third holiest site in Islam. And then, you, of course, you have the Holy Sepulchre, which is the holiest site for Christians. Uh, we're looking down on this image that Simon took with great danger to his life, looking down uh, at the uh, Easter celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. That's the, the traditional tomb of Jesus. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that place shortly. Okay, hold on, I'm just, there we go. Now, What's really unique about this city that you don't find in places like Rome or Paris or New York is that it has an unusual geology. The geology of Jerusalem is peculiar because 
it's built on limestone. And this limestone creates through the action of water, all kinds of natural tunner, tunnels and caverns and rivers that flow underground. And also there's very little timber there. So as a result, people had to use stone in order to build. And this stone is really unusual, not just for its beautiful golden hue that many of you who've been to Jerusalem have seen at sunset, it also is easy to, to quarry, but then it hardens once it gets above ground. So as a result, the city is really a city of arches, arches that were designed to hold the weight of buildings. And over time, those buildings would become cisterns or become sewers, and uh, then you would build a new set of arches on top of those. So it's really unusual in that the city has so many layers, uh, unlike uh, many other cities in the area. Oops, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my forward and backward here, so bear with me. So this gives you an idea of what's going on beneath the city. So I stayed for a good deal of time in the old city, in the Christian quarter, and that's within the walls of the old city. And one day I went to my local grocery store, as I did, and the owner, who was a Muslim, said, you know, who are you? What, what are you doing here? You're not a tourist. You've been here too long. And I explained what I was doing, and he laughed. He walked to the potato chip aisle. He lifted up a hatch, and he vanished down the hatch. Well, I put my groceries down and followed him. And with our iPhone lights, we were shining through the darkness and we could barely see the very end of this massive crusader hall that was built obviously long ago during the crusader period and had been long lost. Now, secretly, the neighbors who were the Coptic monks who lived in the Holy Sepulcher, which is next door, had been digging out the space. And when he discovered this, there was a little bit of a, a fight between them and then a 20 year long legal battle over who owned this enormous cavernous space right in the heart of Jerusalem. And this was just, so that became a, a full chapter in my book. And this was just my local grocery store. So that gives you an idea of the complexity of this place. Now, uh, bear with me. In one slide, I'm going to try and tell you the entire history of Jerusalem, and then we'll get to the main event, which is talking about the archaeology. But I really want to give you the historical context. It's very important. So think of Jerusalem's 5,000 years of history in three blocks. The first is that period when cities were first being built in the Middle East, around 3000 BC. And that's when the first settlers come to stay in Jerusalem. Uh, there's a, a spring that provides water, and you can see at the, the top right there, uh, there's these walls that were built to protect this spring. You have all kinds of Bronze Age peoples, the Egyptians are there, uh, you have eventually Canaanites that settle, uh, who turn Jerusalem into a, a good-sized town, not an enormous city, but uh, you know, a good-sized hill town in the Judean highlands. Now that changed around 1000 BC or a little after, when these people that we call the Israelites arrived. And they conquer Jerusalem and turn it into the capital of what becomes known as Judea. Now, it's not just Judeans who are there during this thousand years that we think of uh, as kind of the prime period of Jerusalem's history. Uh, there are also Assyrians and Babylonians and Greeks and Romans, uh, an enormous diversity of Middle Eastern peoples and Central Asian peoples even who are moving in and out of this area. So Jerusalem is, uh, is actually kind of at the heart of, uh, of what's going on in this period of the Iron Age and on to the time of the Romans. And finally, then in 70 CE, as I'm sure you all probably know, uh, during the Civil War, the Romans uh, enter Jerusalem, uh, they destroy the city, and it is then rebuilt a uh, hundred or so years later. And when it's rebuilt, it's rebuilt as a kind of Roman city. So the city you see today is really based on that Roman city that was constructed uh, at the order of Emperor Hadrian. Now, subsequently, you have Persians, you have Byzantines, Byzantines being essentially Romanized or Christianized Romans. Uh, and then, of course, in the seventh century, Islam arrives and you have uh, the uh, Arab Muslims who are there followed by the Crusaders and lots of back and forth for a few centuries until finally around 1500, about the same time that Martin Luther launches the Reformation, the Ottomans were a Turkic people based in Istanbul, uh, the former Constantinople, 
they take over this area for the next 500 years, all the way to World War I, Jerusalem is under Ottoman control. So there you go, Jerusalem's history in one slide. All right, now this is the part that uh, for me was fresh and I found utterly fascinating. And that is in the 1860s, this race to rediscover biblical Jerusalem began. And let's start with the first character uh, who I found uh, to be so compelling. He was a French senator and a military officer. He was also a friend of Napoleon III, who was the emperor of France at the time, which was a major empire. And because he was friends to an important person, he got permission from the Sultan in Istanbul to dig in Jerusalem. This was the first legal dig. He got a license to dig. And where did he chose? He chose the Tomb of the Kings, the bottom right there. You can still visit it. It's really the largest, most magnificent tomb in Jerusalem. A lot of people don't know about it. But, uh, but this uh, French, uh, I won't call him an archaeologist. He really was an explorer. He found this uh, amazing sarcophagus. And what was inside were the remains of a woman, clearly a royal woman, because they're golden threads uh, woven that she had been wrapped in. He declared her a Judean queen, hauled it off to the Louvre, where it became a sensation. I mean, think of the, the King Tut exhibit in the 1970s, you know, times 100. So uh, this created a sensation. For the first time, Westerners could go to a museum and see remains from biblical times. At a time when uh, Christianity was under a lot of pressure from geologists and biologists who were saying that much of the Bible simply wasn't true. So this really sparked a major interest in archaeology, or I should say, in digging up biblical Jerusalem. But at the same time, it also infuriated the Jews who lived in Jerusalem. They protested to their friends in Paris and, and London, and there was an international outcry. They said, you are desecrating the graves of our ancestors. How dare you do this, you French Catholics? Uh, but that did not stop the British. Uh, the following year, the British, not to be outdone by the French, uh, they weren't going to let the British Museum sit empty of biblical artifacts. So they put together this fund to send archaeologists, or I should say diggers, excavators, to the city in order to really map and understand what was beneath the city. And one of these characters was Charles Warren, who uh, you'll see here, he's uh, caricatured. He was very famous, called Jerusalem Warren. And here are some images that were actually just taken uh, a few weeks ago in Jerusalem. And this is one of the passages that he mapped. And some of you may have walked this path in what is now called the Western Wall Tunnel. And look at the, the sheer size of this. And this tunnel goes on for a very long way. That's the street above. But when Warren was there, this whole area was filled uh, at least up to say 10 feet or so with sewage. So he had some very difficult conditions. Uh, to try and map what was beneath the city. And he also had all kinds of cave-ins and rocks that he had to deal with. So he used gunpowder to actually blow his way through some of these tunnels in order to map them. Now, needless to say, that didn't go over well with the Arab Muslims because he was doing this right next to the Acropolis, right next to the Temple Mount or Noble Sanctuary. So these raised a lot of fears among the locals that the British were actually intent on destroying their holy site. And there were protests from the city council uh, and a family called the Abu Sauds. You can see the bottom left, their complex before it was destroyed after 1967. Uh, actually, interesting little side uh, is that uh, Arafat uh, actually was a child uh, in that complex uh, in the 1930s and 40s. In any case, there was growing tension between the Ottoman rulers who wanted to give the Europeans what they wanted because they wanted the European uh, technology, European money. Uh, they wanted to play nice with the Europeans. And the, the people who felt victimized by this were the Arab Muslims. And this had a huge impact on the future of Jerusalem. Now, just briefly, I, wanna, I mentioned the Holy Sepulcher, and this is a, a, a really interesting question that came up. When the first tourists and explorers arrived from the West in the 1860s, in fact, Mark Twain was among them. Uh, as a young reporter, he went to Jerusalem when it was first opening up to outside uh, Westerners. 
The question was, where was Jesus actually crucified and buried? So Westerner, particularly Protestants, would arrive. They'd go to the Holy Sepulcher, which is a very dark and dingy and, and, uh, and a rather overwhelming place. Now, Protestants didn't have a piece of it because they were late to the party. Uh, the Catholics and Greek Orthodox and other Christian sects controlled it. Uh, so there was a little bit of sour grapes in these Protestants saying, oh, this is all fake. This is all uh, a tradition that has no basis in scientific fact. And it wasn't just sour grapes, because if you look at the map to the left, you'll see here's the old city here, right? Those are the walls. And the Holy Sepulcher is almost in the center of the, the old city. So we know the Gospels say that Jesus was crucified and buried outside of the walls. Therefore, Protestants said that proves that this is actually not the site of Jesus' crucifixion, much less his burial. Now, this became a, a major battle between this interesting uh, British general named Charles Gordon, Gordon of Khartoum. You may have heard of him. Uh, who was it that played him uh, in, in a movie uh, years ago? In any case, he uh, insisted, he was on sabbatical in Jerusalem, and he insisted that the true site of the crucifixion and resurrection was at a place uh, just north of the city because it looked like a skull. Uh, Golgotha is the name of the place given in the Gospels for Jesus' death, and that means place of the skull in Aramaic. He didn't have a lot to go on scientifically, but he was a famous guy, and that tradition stuck. So today, you can go to the Garden Tomb, and many Protestants do, and it looks kind of like you would imagine. If you go to, went to Sunday school, that's what Jesus' tomb would look like, kind of a little garden with, with nice stone tombs. But there's nothing first century about it. Now, meanwhile, a friend of his, uh, a really interesting guy named uh, Conrad Schick, he was a Ku Klux repairman and a missionary who became one of the great architects in Jerusalem. And he decided uh, to work with the Russians in order to see whether or not the Holy Sepulchre was, in fact, uh, whether the tradition was uh, based on science or could be proven by science. And going back to this map, so he dug just to the east of the Holy Sepulchre. And sure enough, he found what he declared to be first century CE walls. So in other words, he found the walls of the city were here, and that meant that the Holy Sepulchre was actually outside of the city uh, at the time of the death of Jesus. So while this doesn't prove the Holy Sepulchre is the place, it did bolster the tradition and kind of put the lie to uh, people like uh, the British general who insisted that it was outside of Jerusalem. So here's an example where science is used to actually back up different points of view. Now, by the 1890s, the big question became, where's the city of David? Uh, the Bible, of course, is replete with fantastic descriptions of the city that the Queen of Sheba came to visit when King Solomon, the son of King David, was uh, the head of a local empire. And you can see here in the middle, artists in the 19th century had all these ideas of uh, that Solomon's tomb as they imagined it. So certainly there would be a lot to find. But archaeologists could not seem to find any evidence of this key time in Jerusalem's history. And looking here at the bottom left, you'll see this outline in pink of the old city today. And these gentlemen, uh, Bliss and Dickey, or Dickey and Bliss, I always get them mixed up with their droopy mustaches. In any case, they dug uh, in uh, the area to the south, Mount Zion, down here, if you can see my cursor. And they found nothing, so then they started to dig along this little peninsula that sticks out from the Acropolis. And there's also that spring that I mentioned that's there, so it seemed like a good bet. And sure enough, they found pottery that clearly was from an earlier period. They didn't find any architecture, but they did find enough pottery to be able to say, hey, this looks like this is the place where David was king. But people were still interested in finding uh, objects, particularly things like the Ark of the Covenant, shown there on the right, that had, according to the Bible, been in, in Solomon's temple and uh, had vanished some point around the time of the Babylonian invasion uh, five centuries later. So this created a kind of rush to find the Ark of the Covenant and the temple treasures. And this was so much fun to, to dig into. 
this is one of the more compelling uh, or interesting characters in Jerusalem's excavation history, Montague Brownlow Parker, a very wealthy British aristocrat who hooked up with a Finnish theologian who had some uh, interesting ideas about uh, the book of Ezekiel. He believed he'd crack the code that explained that the Ark of the Covenant and the temple treasures, thought to be worth billions of dollars on the art market, could be found in tunnels beneath Jerusalem. So he put together a team that included, uh, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, a Swiss psychic, uh, a Congo River steamboat captain, uh, a, a very famous cricket star. Uh, they did neglect to hire an archeologist, well, uh, but they began to dig. And they even had the engineer for the London Tube to come to help them bore tunnels beneath the city. Now, of course, they, they found very little or really nothing of value besides some pottery, but uh, Parker became desperate. And so in the last days of the expedition, he bribed the guard at the Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary, the city's Acropolis, and managed to get inside the Dome of the Rock, that golden dome that covers the place where Muhammad is said to have gone up to heaven on a mystical journey, and began whacking away at this stone because he was convinced that the Ark of the Covenant was hidden beneath it. Of course, he was discovered, a mob gathered, and he and his team barely got out of Jerusalem alive. Now, uh, it didn't end there because there were, the riots that followed almost, uh, almost broke the Ottoman government. The Ottoman government nearly fell over this political crisis. And as far away as uh, India, Muslims sent uh, envoys to see if, in fact, Parker had damaged this important holy site for Islam. Now remember the British Empire was controlling India then, so the British were terrified that there was gonna be a Muslim uprising. So again, you can see how just the, the smallest event in Jerusalem can echo out, can ricochet out across the world. Now, by this time, uh, the Jews of Europe were beginning to take note. They had not participated in excavations up to this point. But finally, they began to realize that these Christians, these Western Christians, were dominating this uh, fight to control and get the good stuff from beneath Jerusalem. And Baron Edmund de Rothschild, for example, uh, the, the wealthy French aristocrat and, and banker, put together a crack excavation team to go and see if they could, allegedly, they were going to just find the the tomb of uh, David and Solomon, but actually what they were looking for was the Ark of the Covenant and the temple treasures. Why? They did not want them to fall into Christian hands, much less the hands of people like Parker, who clearly were interested in selling these things for a profit on the art market. So this is a point where in the early days of Zionism, of Jewish Zionism, that uh, Jews in Europe began to think that Jerusalem was an important place, not just because of its history, but also because of what lay below the city. Now, I'm gonna race through the early 20th century. Let's just say not a lot of archeology span happened. First, the British finally succeeded in their quest to control Jerusalem. 1917, the British conquered Jerusalem from the Ottomans. And then it turned out to be not such a great deal for them because from the 1920s on, there were terrible clashes between the Arab population, the Arab Muslims and Christians, uh, with the Jewish immigrants who were increasing during the 20s and 30s, and, and certainly in the wake of the Holocaust. So in 1948, uh, Britain withdrew from Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Israel was created. There was a war. Uh, Jerusalem was then divided between Israel and Jordan. And in fact, Jerusalem became like Berlin uh, became a dozen years later when the Berlin Wall was built. It was actually a wall separating uh, parts of Jerusalem. And the old city, the one that has the shrines we've discussed, that fell into Jordanian territory. Now that changed in 1967. In 1967, the city fell to the Israelis. And for the first time, Israeli Jewish archaeologists uh, came to town and they replaced the British and French Christians that had dominated the digging below uh, up to Jordanian times. So this really changed the map. And there are these two men that came up with some very interesting findings. The first, Benjamin Mazar on the left, very distinguished scholar who was the head of Hebrew University, 
uh, and really kind of the first Israeli archaeologist. He uncovered uh, remains from the time of Herod the Great and in that century after, before the Roman destruction, that show that the Temple Mount had, in fact, as people had suspected, been a very grand uh, complex. You see here uh, what was probably the world's largest uh, pedestrian overpass in the ancient world leading up to the Temple Mount where the Jewish temple was located. And uh, this was important news for Israelis who claimed Jerusalem as their own. They said, see, we have the evidence. This was an important city for Jews 2000 years ago. Now, meanwhile, another Israeli archeologist who was a colleague of, of Mazar, the gentleman in blue on the right, Meyer Ben Dov, uh, still alive, I spent a good deal of time with him in Jerusalem. He began to dig just south of the Temple Mount. And you see here in this schematic, you see there's the Dome of the Rock uh, in the center there uh, that, is the, that covers the, the famous rock. Al-Aqsa Mosque is here. But what Ben Dov found, nobody had seen before. He found the foundations of these massive buildings and they turned out to be early Islamic palaces. No one had any idea that Jerusalem was of such political, not just religious, but political importance to early Muslims. And this was so controversial when it was found that when Ben Dov went to a colleague of his, a very esteemed colleague, and said what he had found, the response he got was, do you have a bulldozer? Ben Dov said, well, of course. He said, bulldoze it before anybody finds out. Now, Ben Dov, as a good archaeologist, refused to do so and, in fact, released information immediately so that the media knew they'd found these palaces because it was very controversial, this idea that for Muslims, Jerusalem was an important city politically as well as religiously. So again, we see that the discovery of something 1,400 years old has immediate ramifications in this city. Now, I won't go into great detail about this, but uh, this is the Western Wall Tunnel. Some of you may have visited it, and uh, this just gives you a sense of the scale of it. Essentially, it was a secret project in the beginning, starting in 1967, to dig a tunnel all the way along the foundation of the Western Wall that forms one side of the Temple Mount or Noble Sanctuary complex, a tremendous undertaking that also happened to pass directly beneath the heart of the Muslim quarter of Jerusalem. So again, we have, we have people digging beneath the place where the locals live. The locals didn't like this. Uh, they didn't like it when they were Christians and they didn't like it when the diggers were Jewish rabbis. And very little archeology span was done in this process. Uh, and so tragically, a lot, of, uh, a lot of material was probably lost. And also there was enormous violence that resulted. When they opened uh, in the mid nineties and they opened the northern end of this tunnel, Muslims uh, uh, rioted. And in the end, more than 100 people died, thousands were injured. And it really began the, uh, it was the beginning of the end of the Oslo Accords, which were attempting to create a Palestinian state so that Arab Muslims and Christians could live with Israeli Jews in peace. So again, you see that uh, digging in Jerusalem is not simply a scholarly activity. Now, in the 1990s and 2000s, the big talk was about the city of David. You remember, it was clear that the city of David likely was in that little peninsula just south of the Temple Mount or Noble Sanctuary, uh, but nobody had found any buildings, nothing from the early days of David and Solomon. They'd found material from later, but not during those key early generations. The archaeologist Elat Mazar, who uh, unfortunately passed away in May, uh, she uncovered this ancient building that she said was, in fact, the Palace of David. This was big news. It was front page news all over the world. Now, subsequently, many of her colleagues have disputed this claim, and they don't believe she has the dating evidence to be able to pinpoint it in the way she has. It remains controversial, but it just shows you that, uh, that finding an ancient palace in Jerusalem is not like finding one in Egypt or in Mesopotamia. That, that this is something that has immediate uh, implications for the politics of the present. Because, of course, it was a little embarrassing to many uh, Israeli, Israelis who believe that Jerusalem was the eternal capital of Israel if you couldn't find the original site of the city of David. So this is where politics and religion and science certainly come together in a stormy fashion. 
And another uh, important project, in fact, this is the most controversial, the most expensive, and I'd say uh, the most ambitious uh, archaeological project on Earth right now. This is the attempt to build a tunnel to expose an ancient Roman era street that ran from the base of that little peninsula all the way up to the Temple Mount during, well, it was thought to be during the time of Herod. But when they began this project, which is taking place beneath a largely Muslim uh, neighborhood, they discovered using, the, using uh, archaeological techniques like looking at the date on a coin, that this street was probably built not under the order of Herod the Great, but by the greatest villain uh, in Jerusalem's history, that is Pontius Pilate, a man reviled by both Christians and Jews. And what made this so interesting was that the, the images of Herod the Great as somebody uh, who beautified Jerusalem, and Pontius Pilate was somebody who disdained, uh, of course, not just Judaism, but also Jesus himself and sent him to death. Now, this shows a different side of Pontius Pilate, where he clearly put a lot of time, effort, and money uh, into building this monumental street that went up to Judaism's most sacred site, the Jewish temple. So this really gives us, a, I think, a more nuanced view of the Romans in Jerusalem in that period. Uh, it's not necessarily as kind of ancient Nazis, but as a, a more complicated relationship that they had with the people that they ruled. And I'm not going to go into detail about this. There's a, an article I just did in Archaeology Magazine that goes into uh, a great deal of detail. This is a dig that's across the street from where uh, Elat Mazar found what she claimed to be David's palace. <clears throat> and if you look at the image on the left, you'll see the Golden Dome of the Dome of the Rock, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and then below it is this tremendous site called the, was called the Gavati parking lot, uh, which is one of the few places near the old city where you can dig, where it's not been heavily built. So uh, archaeologists have been working there for a good 10, 15 years and have uncovered really fascinating uh, finds. For the first time, we're seeing physical evidence of these important periods in Jerusalem's history that were until now only known through texts like the Bible. For example, the Persian period, when many believe the most of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible was written. Uh, also the Hellenistic period, uh, the time of Hanukkah, for example, it was completely invisible or almost completely invisible in the archeological record. So for the first time, we're seeing these interesting imports, uh, images of animals and people that you wouldn't expect to find close to the sacred site uh, of a religion in which uh, images like that were taboo. So it, again, it paints a more nuanced picture of a Jerusalem that is very closely tied in with the, the wider Middle East uh, than we tend to think of it. Uh, and in the course of these digs, one of the questions comes up of, well, is it legal to dig here? And the Gavati parking lot is in East Jerusalem, which under international law is considered to be occupied territory. And under international treaties signed by Israel, you can't dig in occupied territory without the people you occupy giving permission, which the Palestinians have not. Now, the Israelis argue, the Israeli government argues that, in fact, it is now annexed, it's part of Israel, and so there's not a question. But still, there are these uh, really challenging uh, ethical and legal issues facing digs, such as the tunnel uh, under the, the exposing that monumental street and the Gavati parking lot, which lies right next to it. So what I found was that digging actually has been always and remains part of the conflict above. You cannot separate these two. Um, and as in the 19th century, you still have the uh, local Palestinians, the local Arabs complaining that buildings are getting damaged by the digs that are happening below. And understandably, if people were tunneling beneath your house, you might not be happy. And if there were people you disagreed with politically and were of a different religion, you might really have strong feelings about that. And again, as in the 19th century, you had patrons with very, very strong political and religious agendas, whether it's, say, Queen Victoria, who helped fund the Palestine Exploration Fund, or whether it's today the City of David Foundation, known as Elad, uh, which uh, is busy not just funding projects like the tunnel beneath exposing the Roman era street, but also funding the settlement of Jews into a largely Muslim neighborhood. 
So you have these kinds of conflicts. Uh, and here's David Barry to the right, who is a uh, picture I took uh, when they, they had a ceremonial opening of that tunnel a couple of years ago. Uh, there's the tunnel there. And then talking to Arafat Hamdan, who was a, a local, local man who lived in a house that showed me damage that he claimed was caused by the tunnel being built beneath. And of course, you, there's been terrible violence, not just in this neighborhood, but in other parts of Jerusalem, you can pick up the newspaper and read all about it. So just to wrap up, because I, I do want to get to questions, one of the things that I was really stunned by in the course of my research was to discover that it was Western Christians, not Jews and not Muslims, who sparked this fight to control Jerusalem. It was their arrival in the 1860s, which made it a place that Western uh, colonial powers wanted to control, and that this in turn had a big impact on both Zionism as well as on uh, uh, Arab-Palestinian nationalism. And the other piece that, that I think is, is, is important to think about is that the more biblical archaeology that gets done, the more people like me and others write about it. Media loves biblical stories, but that in turn creates more funding for biblical archaeology, and uh, that leads to more uh, biblical digs. Nothing wrong with that, but it's just important to remember that there is an emphasis on this biblical millennium that often leaves out these other four millennium that make up part of Jerusalem's history. And, you know, in the end, I, I actually came away with a, with a very, I won't say a positive, but at least a glimmer of hope uh, in the city that is so uh, tortured. You know, I really came to feel that science can support and challenge uh, these uh, strict political and religious narratives that, that rule the day. And I can only hope that there's uh, an alternative vision that they might be able to provide, which would give, well, let's say, I don't mean to say that science will heal the open wound that is Jerusalem. I mean, this is and remains the world's toughest geopolitical knot, no question. But I do hold out hope that the research conducted over the past century and a half will gradually, eventually, provide a deeper and better understanding of this fascinating place. Because here, for better or for worse, the three great monotheisms have shared ideas as much as they have fought each other, and the city is really the, the rich product of all of these traditions. So maybe someday Jerusalem can live up to its name, the city of peace. So with that, I want to thank you very much. I hope I've whetted your appetite uh, for the stories and characters that appear in the book. And I would be delighted to take questions. So Andrew. Uh... We have some questions in the, the chat box, or we could have people raise their hand and ask you the questions directly. What do you prefer? Oh, why don't you just read me the questions? How's okay. that? So everybody right. can be sounds on the page. Good. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let me just see the first one. Give me a moment. Okay, so here we go. Uh, This is from Jonathan Pavluk. It says, how reliable is the placement of our modern archaeological digs to be able to validate biblical testimony regarding location of a subterranean water feature such as the Gihon Spring to, um, to inform us whether it can be truly traced back to the time of King Solomon, who was reportedly anointed king at the Gihon Spring? and there's a biblical citation, or was the mouth of the spring possibly subject to change over time? Okay, great, great question. So the Gihon Spring is located on that, that little peninsula that we showed just south of the Acropolis, the Temple Mount or Noble Sanctuary. So just so people can orient themselves. Now, it's an interesting spring. It clearly has been flowing as long as people have been in Jerusalem. It has a it pulsates as well. It flows a little bit more and a little bit less every day. It has almost a tide, but it's it, it constantly is putting out water. So from the beginning, this has been a central point of Jerusalem. This is why people could settle there. That's why people could live there, you know, well into Roman times when, of course, you had the aqueducts. So whether or not this is the place where King Solomon was, uh, was anointed king, which is mentioned in the biblical text, 
Archaeology cannot give us that information. We know that the site was fortified by the Bronze Age, peoples who lived there centuries before the Israelites arrived. So clearly it was an important place, and there's no doubt that kings would have been there. Now, uh, archaeology, as I say, simply cannot prove or disprove uh, these specific textual mentions like that. Uh, but it can give us a sense of the, the, uh, how long it's been there. And there's no doubt that the Gihon Spring has been uh, a central feature of Jerusalem's history for the past five millennia. Okay, let's go on to the next one. It's from Kevin Campbell. What is your personal ethical view of archeology span that tunnels under and explores underground digs without the consent of the surface owners? Well, this is a, it's a tough question because I actually spoke with several lawyers, Israeli lawyers, about what is the law? Who owns what's underground? And in the case of the, uh, the potato chip aisle, where I went down into that crusader vault, uh, the series of vaults that were there, uh, it was, as I mentioned, a 20-year legal battle because it wasn't clear who owned it. So. I think that it's um, very difficult to assign ownership to these places. And as a result, they're all contested. So who owns the Western Wall Tunnel uh, beneath the Muslim quarter? Is it the Muslim uh, shop owners who have a store above? Or is it the Israeli government, which claims it? Or is it some other entity? I mean, these are questions that kind of are above my pay grade. But clearly, they are. Uh, this is part of the contentious issue that, that we face in Jerusalem, and that we really until those issues get resolved, who owns what uh, will remain uh, a spark that can in any moment ignite violence in the city. Okay, this is from Bert Solomon. Please tell us more about the nature of the tunnels and spaces such as Solomon's stables that are underground. Right, uh, well, I could do that much better if I read you my book. <laughs> uh, because I do go into detail. I know this is very confusing. There's so there's so many layers to this city. That's why at the beginning of every chapter, I have a map uh, that shows what that chapter will talk about so that you can get oriented. So the answer is, you name it. There are tunnels that were built in, in Bronze Age times to channel water that weren't fully covered in some places, all the way up to today's modern tunnel that is beneath uh, that neighborhood uh, that, that Jews call the City of David, Wadi Hilwa for, for Muslims, that is basically a subway tunnel. It's as large as a subway tunnel and it's sophisticated. So you have everything in between. Uh, and not just tunnels, of course, but you have cavernous spaces. In fact, the largest underground space in Jerusalem, uh, which I didn't go into, it's Zedekiah's Cave or Solomon's Quarries, which is under most of the, or a good portion of the Muslim quarter. And it's actually the, the place where the stone was quarried to build the city above. Uh, so they come in all shapes and sizes. Okay, our next question is from Ozzy Orbach. Uh, it says here, legally, my understanding is that the church or the state of Israel owns the land beneath the buildings. Oh, well, that's interesting. I, I got different points of view from, depending on the lawyers I spoke with, some, some cited uh, Israeli law as uh, being the same as Ottoman law uh, or British law, both of which are very different in the way they treat ownership. In, in Britain, you know, the king owns everything, uh, ultimately. But under Ottoman law, you know, the Ottomans didn't own what was below, could, the government couldn't own what was below ground. So uh, I'd be interested in hearing more. Uh, you can contact me via my website, andrewlawler.com. Love to have a conversation with you and find, find out more about this question of, of ownership because I couldn't get a straight answer. Okay, this, mess, uh, this question is from Barbara Hopp. How accessible are these sites to an ordinary tourist? How might one visit post COVID restrictions, of course? Right. Well, uh, many tunnels, such as the Western Wall Tunnel, are, are fully accessible uh, to tourists. The uh, monumental street, that the Roman era street that I showed, that is partially open to tourists now. Uh, I know there are some restrictions because of COVID, but tourists are visiting those sites. And you know, I should also mention that 
most of the underground sites, of course, are not available to tourists. There are places like the one underneath the grocery store I went to. Uh, but these are not just tourist sites, they're often uh, sites for Jewish worship as well. The Western Wall Tunnel was built really for worship, not for archaeology or for tourists originally. And so this is controversial. Um, visiting these sites, you can move underground in Jerusalem and often never really encounter, say, a, a local Arab. Um, so in a way, there's controversy about whether this underground world that's being created for tourists uh, in a way presents the Jerusalem, uh, it, it, it really presents more of a, a Jewish view of Jerusalem than it does an Arab or uh, whether that's a Muslim or Christian view. So this is part of the uh, controversy around what is underground. Okay. Our next question is from Peter Golan. Are there any joint Israeli-Palestinian excavations in the area? That's a great question. I did speak with uh, a number of Palestinian archaeologists. Uh, there, are, there are a few, there are not many, but they are forbidden from digging in Jerusalem. Uh, they are not allowed to dig. The Israeli Antiquities Authority, which is under Israeli government control, determines who gets a dig license. And those people have to be credentialed through the Israeli system. Now, there are, uh, there are Israeli Arabs or Israeli Palestinians, depending on how you want to use the term, who are archaeologists for the, the IAA, but they tend not to work in Jerusalem because it's such a controversial area. Every archaeologist I met there, uh, with very few exceptions, was an Israeli Jew. So at this point, uh, joint, uh, joint digs between the two sides seem virtually impossible, in part because for Palestinians to work with Israeli archaeologists wouldn't reflect well on them and the Palestinian community. Now that said, Palestinian archeologists are doing work in areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority, but that is well outside of East Jerusalem. This question is from Henry. Aside from the questionable David's Palace, what other buildings can be identified from the earliest Jewish kingdom? Uh, well, good question. Just, just a point about terminology, and I had to get smart about this. Uh, the, the term Jewish is usually not applied until later, till say Hasmonean or Roman times. Judean is, is what, uh, arch, that's a term archeologists tend to use. But at this point, there are, there's no building that has been found within Jerusalem that uh, has been convincingly dated to the period, say, uh, the time of King David, presumably in the, in the 10th century. Uh, up until for like maybe two centuries after that. Uh, beyond that period, there are lots of uh, Judean buildings. But in that era, uh, it's very hard to do the dating properly because pottery doesn't necessarily change that quickly. Uh, there's been so much reuse of material. Now, Elat Mazar claimed to have found walls that date to the, the time of Solomon. But again, Solomon, uh, although he's mentioned in the Bible, is is there's been no evidence outside of the Bible for his existence. So it makes it, it makes it very hard for archaeologists to really pinpoint. And this has been um, the major controversial issue in Israeli archaeology is where is the Jerusalem of King David and Solomon? And we still don't have good answers. Okay. The next one is, I'm, I can't see you, uh, from whom? Uh, what is the evidence for the garden versus the sepulcher version of the tomb of Jesus? Well, uh, there have been excavations since the one done by Conrad Schick, who I mentioned uh, found those walls that he dated to the first century uh, around the time of Jesus. Uh, there have been subsequent excavations that have called that into question, but other excavations have shown pretty clearly that the Holy Sepulcher was located uh, on what was uh, a quarry. Uh, what had been a quarry, which is kind of hinted at in the Gospels, and that it seems that the tradition does seem to match with the archaeology. Uh, again, you can't prove it, but you can see if it contradicts or if it supports the traditional account that's found in the New Testament uh, in the Gospels. Now, when it comes to the garden tomb, from the archaeologists I spoke with, there is no evidence that any of the tombs in that area are even from the first century, much less that they were, uh, were any of them were the tomb that could be assigned to Jesus. 
In fact, they are probably are much earlier and some are much later. And uh, it's more of a, um, of a tradition, I'll say. I'm not gonna say it's not true, but I will say it's a tradition that that is among many Protestants, that, that is the site of Jesus' death and resurrection. But I think it really has more to do with uh, wanting to have an environment that feels more like the gospel. And that certainly does have more of a feel of uh, what you read in the gospel than the, the, the dark and dingy Holy Sepulcher. Okay, this is a uh, question is from Rhonda. Do you think that Israel's voluntary returning of Egyptian artifacts will increase participation regarding archaeology in general? Uh, it's certainly possible. I mean, certainly uh, things are changing uh, when it comes to the relationship between uh, Israel, Israel and, and the Arab countries around it. Uh, but there's still a, a long way to go. Um, you know, Israel has some very good, very advanced archaeology that they're doing that would benefit uh, many Arab countries that uh, still are struggling to find the funding to be able to train archaeologists. So that probably is would be a, a, a positive step to try and uh, train a new generation of archaeologists, uh, not as Israeli or as or as Arab, whether it's Egyptian or Iraq or what have you, uh, but really as as Middle Eastern archaeologists. And this is so important because in order to understand Jerusalem, you have to understand the wider area. You can't just look within the borders of Israel. We need to understand what was going on in Jordan 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. Uh, Petra is very close. It's very, it's just right across the Dead Sea from Jerusalem. So we need to understand these connections. And in order to do that, we really need archaeologists who can look beyond their national borders. Okay. This message is from Marion. Uh, what is your opinion of Israel Finkelstein's interpretation of ancient archaeology in Israel? Ah, right. Well, I can blame Israel Finkelstein, who's a Tel Aviv University archaeologist, for uh, setting me on this book idea in the first place. He's the one that took me on the tour beneath uh, the city and introduced me to all the archaeologists there. Um, he, however, himself does not dig in Jerusalem, but he has some uh, interesting and, of course, controversial theories. Uh, he has a, a very, uh, what is called a minimalist view of Jerusalem. He believes Jerusalem in that 10th century, the time of David, was more of a small, very small hill town, and that David was more of a tribal chieftain, and that the stories that we, we get from the Hebrew Bible are actually the remembrances of people who lived centuries later, looking back on their origins as a kind of golden age, maybe sort of as we look back on our founding fathers, that it's not necessarily true. Uh, and the archaeology uh, would seem to bear him out, but there are others who have argued that uh, the evidence is there, he's not dating them correctly. And actually the two sides, Finkelstein and the maximalists, those who believe in a larger, more powerful Jerusalem in that era, they've actually come to a, a kind of middle ground that the science and the radiocarbon dating that they've been doing are bringing them closer. So there's really only say a 50 year difference in what they're arguing now. So I think it's, uh, I think the science is slowly beginning to tell a tale that uh, neither side is correct, both are right, and uh, somewhere in the middle we'll find what is uh, more likely truthful. Now I'm afraid you've frozen. Karen, can you hear me? I'm afraid I can't hear you, Karen. You'll have to unmute yourself. Hi there. Um, there Todd has lost his connection, so perhaps I will take over. Okay, go ahead and take over. Um, is it true that three valleys underlie the Jewish temple and form the holy letter Shin, Kidron, Ben Hinnom, and Tyra Poan? European, yes. Um, well, is, is that a myth? And that is from uh, F, <laughs> from Fred. Well, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I've never heard that before. But yes, it is true that these deep valleys run through Jerusalem. And we don't see them today as well because they've been filled in over time. Over time, sewage and debris have entered uh, you know, into those valleys and built them up somewhat. And there've been so, there's been so much construction that it's really hard. In fact, I, I showed uh, earlier 
uh, a, a, a map of uh, Jerusalem's geology of the, of the surface without the buildings. And that shows you that it is really a, a very mountainous, very hilly terrain. But as to whether or not it is shaped in a Hebrew letter, I'm, I'm not the one to be able to confirm or deny. I feel badly because Dennis Blum has had a question. Dennis, are you there? Um, or maybe Dennis has his hand up. Dennis, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, then you can ask a question. Maybe. I'm back, Karen. Is Dennis, we've asked Dennis to unmute himself. That may be a mistake. Let's go on to Thomas Rippon's uh, question. Ancient seabeds, which become limestone rock formations, lead to sinkholes. Is that a problem on this Acropolis? Uh, it's a problem across Jerusalem. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the, the funny thing about Jerusalem's underground is it looks solid because it's lime, it's stone. But uh, one day I was walking down the street uh, above the tunnel that's being built beneath the city of David or Wadi Hilwa, as the Muslims call it. And uh, I walked past the mosque parking lot and there was a, a big hole that had opened up during recent heavy rains. And a cement truck from the city had pulled up and was, you know, they pulled out the, the, uh, the sluice and they began to dump cement into this, what seemed like a very large pothole. Well, as I'm watching moments, moments later, this guy runs out from the tunnel and starts screaming, no stop. And the cement was actually going into the hole and then going down into the tunnel that they were excavating. Uh, so the, the, the soil is so treacherous. Charles Warren, the archeologist in the 1860s said that it could turn from rock into liquid in moments, that it was extremely dangerous and very unstable because of its properties, not just because of the limestone, but also because there's been so many centuries of buildings being destroyed and debris and what have you, that it's a very unstable place. So yeah, it's uh, quite dangerous actually to dig beneath the city and you have to be very careful. Now D asks, and this is very flattering, are you willing to lead a group of us to us to go with you to study this as a Harvard travel group? <laughs> Well, I'm Hello. open to it. I'm, I'm planning to go back to Jerusalem actually early next year uh, to work on another assignment. Uh, but you're welcome to contact me at andrewlawler.com and, uh, and we'll talk. Now, is there an inscription in the middle of Hezekiah's tunnel which proves that the tunnel was dug by Judeans during the time of Hezekiah? Yeah, um, good, good, good question. Um, and that is yeah. from Ozzy Orbach. Right. So, yes, there is this fantastic inscription. It's one of the most uh, important inscriptions found in, in the whole region. And it was found by uh, some school children who were playing hooky, I think, back in the 1880s. And they took it to their teacher. And their teacher was Conrad Schick, that architect I mentioned. He's in the middle of everything. He's kind of like the zealot of 19th century Jerusalem. And this plaque, it's clearly written not by a king. It's not a king bragging about uh, what he's done. It's written by the workers, uh, and clearly in in uh, uh, you know in Hebrew. And it's a description of the the workers, the two teams that came together in this tunnel being built to move water from the spring that we talked about down to the area below to put in a, a pool. And so it's really a moving description written by these kind of working class guys carved into a place that no one was ever going to see it because it was going to be filled up with water. Now, as for the construction, I will say that that the tradition has been it was built by Hezekiah in order to uh, provide water for the city in case of uh, an attack by uh, the Assyrians, I believe, or was it the Babylonians? Forgive me. In any case, there's new thinking that it actually was built over a longer period of time earlier, and it probably mimics some Assyrian waterworks that were being constructed in Nineveh, uh, so that they were really trying to, to keep up with uh, the Joneses by building uh, something so elaborate. Well, Nissan Herskowitz 
has said, indeed, the original was taken from Hezekiah's tunnel to a museum in Ankara in the Ottoman era where it remains today. I just, we're trying, we've gotten so many questions. Um, Mary asks, or uh, it, MB asks, is there other significant archaeological evidence outside of Jerusalem that supports the significance of Jerusalem? Well, that's a big question because Jerusalem has 5,000 years of history, so I guess it depends on what period you're talking about. Um, you could talk about the Bronze Age or the Iron Age, uh, the time of the Israelites, um, all the way to the Crusaders. So I, I have to have a little more detail on what period you're interested in. Well, RB, thanks you for this informative and very interesting presentation. Uh, that sentiment has been echoed by many people. Um, Gus Ordonez says the same thing, and London says the same thing. I hope you folks will buy Mr. Lawler's book. Uh, <laughs> AL says the same thing, and then uh, sign me up. This is fabulous. That was from DD. Of, um, um, <laughs> Thomas Rippon says his famous NFL player's name was a punt returner named Hezekiah Braxton. I like those biblical <laughs> names. Uh, this is fantastic. I'd love to travel to Jerusalem and the rest of Israel. I need to jump, but grateful for this offering. Everybody's thrilled with this presentation. Great presentation. Um, the, Any questions? I'm, I'm delighted with the feedback. Uh, another person, uh, the, who is this person? B says, the best athlete's name of all times re remains that of the NBA god Sham God. Um, are there digs accepting volunteers? I know there are, or there used to be. Yeah, there, there absolutely, there are many digs uh, uh, in Israel and in Jerusalem in particular that accept, uh, they, they love to have people come pay to dig uh, because yeah. it's, uh, it's, and sometimes they take volunteers as well, of course. But uh, yeah, that's, that's an important way the archeologists get things done because it's very expensive to do these projects and uh, it's challenging. So students and, and retired people are, are always at the digs that I go to. They always take part. Kenneth Kaufman thanks you. And then we're going on to which major forces of destruction interrupted the construction? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know quite what that refers to. What was the legal outcome of your grocer's cavern? Ah, <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, I'm not going to give it away. Uh, I've given you a, too much already, but I will say that it, it's a, a fascinating case of, of, you have a Muslim shopkeeper in a Christian quarter arguing with Coptic monks and it's all adjudicated by Israeli Jewish judges and lawyers. Uh, and I talked to all of them, and it, it really gave me an appreciation for how complex it is. We tend to think of you know, Muslims and Christians and Jews, but it, it's way more complex than that. And in fact, you find greater uh, arguments and battles between the Christian sects uh, than you do, say, between uh, you know, Christians and Muslims. I mean, it's really amazing uh, how many, the diversity of people. We tend to think in these large groups, but actually there's a lot more going on there that makes it more interesting. Barry Elias says, can you expand on how, oh, can you expand on how and why the Israelites waged war around 3000 BC and, uh, we also have a question about the Armenian quarter. How did, from JR, how did that factor into the excavation? Okay, great. Um, on the Israelites, uh, we really don't know much uh, outside of the biblical text, which of course was written centuries later. Uh, all we really know archaeologically, and I'm speaking archaeologically, I'm not a textual scholar. That's not my thing. Uh, 
all we really know is that sometime in the 10th century, these people conquered Jerusalem and then settled down and created uh, what became known as Judea. Beyond that, it's hard to say. There's evidence that there was a certain house style that they favored, certain pottery. But beyond that, we don't have a lot of archaeological data. Uh, now, the second question, uh, remind me. About the Armenian. Yes, the Armenian quarter. So uh, Armenians, of course, are Christians. There's a Christian quarter and an Armenian quarter. The, the Christian quarter uh, tends to be more Arab Christians, uh, who are Arabic speaking. Uh, they tend to be Greek Orthodox, although there are plenty of exceptions. Uh, the Armenian quarter has been settled for a very, very long time. The Armenians were are very proud of their heritage as some of the, the earliest Christians uh, and the earliest uh, uh, country that accepted Christianity. And so they've had a presence in Jerusalem that goes back to the very early centuries. Uh, and uh, it's a really, they're fascinating. Uh, it's a fascinating history of uh, Armenia in Jerusalem. There have been some very important recent finds of some inscriptions that, that show that Armenians have a, you know, a even longer heritage than people once thought in the city. And they really retain, because of their close-knit family structure, they really retain uh, you know, a, 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 an unusual uh, presence in Jerusalem because uh, they, they keep their language, they keep their traditions, and they have uh, St. James Church, which is a fantastic place to visit if you do go there. Um, we have another question from Barry Elias. Can you expand on how and why the Israelites waged war around 3000 BC? Uh, yeah, this is the Israelite question. Now, I'm not aware of any archaeological evidence of, of Israelites in 3000 BC. Uh, that's in the Bronze Age. And for most of those peoples, we don't even have names for who they were. And particularly if they were nomads, uh, if they were people who wandered with, with flocks, they didn't leave much behind. And this is a, an, a really burning question now in, uh, in studying Jerusalem and the area around it, is were the Israelites actually you know, quite nomadic? And as a result, they didn't leave much evidence, but that doesn't mean they weren't there. Uh, it's very hard to find evidence of, of these nomads, although I've been on digs in Uzbekistan and other places where archaeologists have learned to spot where uh, people who didn't settle down, where they actually had their campsites. So that's really the new frontier in archaeology is understanding how these peoples moved uh, with their flocks and what they left behind that will give us clues as to who they actually were. Um, Ozzy um, Orbach uh, says, Abraham did not exist before 1800 BCE. Um, and then I just, I think our last question is from Nissan Herskowitz. Who named or misnamed Solomon's stables? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, uh, first, the, the first question was about, remind me? Um, that just, it was a comment that Abraham did not. Oh, Abraham, yeah. I can't really address uh, Abraham. We're talking about the patriarchs long before Jerusalem uh, was part of the Israelite story. So. I'll leave that to biblical scholars. Uh, but as to the, uh, the second question, uh, once more, sorry, remind me. Um, um, who named or misnamed yes. Solomon's Stables? Solomon's Stables. Uh, that's a good question. And I'm not sure when it was first used, but I know that Mark Twain was there uh, in uh, 1867. And he actually went in, was one of the first Westerners to go in. and. You have to understand, he called it a wilderness of pillars. It's this enormous underground structure that sits in the southeast corner of the city's Acropolis. And it's not clear when it was built. Now, the, the Crusaders were there uh, in, the, in medieval times, and they're the ones that I believe named it Solomon Stables, and they actually stabled their horses there. Uh, but originally, this was probably... Uh, uh, an early Muslim prayer space that was above ground. And then gradually over time, as the land built up around it, it became an underground space. So it n likely has nothing to do with Solomon. There's no evidence that it's Solomonic in its uh, history. Probably it's more likely based on some of the material built by Herod the Great 
and then added to over the centuries, as is the case with Jerusalem. Uh, you can't always trace it back to one person. It's a series of layers that really reveals the, the, the full, uh, rich history of the place. I think you've given us a great deal to think about this evening. Uh, I think we, we certainly would love to meet you in person and have another discussion. Hopefully then you could do a book signing for us and maybe if, even if we cannot travel to Israel, we could have the pleasure of your company at a, a dinner perhaps in the spring. Uh, we're trying to see if we can do live events now. We will invite everyone who joined us this evening, and it's been a great pleasure. I apologize. Todd's computer went out. We're I'm always back. Oh, you're on, Todd? Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. We're very grateful for you and for everything we've learned this evening, and we wish everyone a very happy holiday season. Uh, and hope we'll be together in person soon again. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>